and be talking about salvation and his redemptive plan for the earth. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, so <coughs> this is the way that I heard it presented. I know you guys will like this. If we were if if we were in Iraq, if we were on a mission somewhere, and there was like a general or whoever, you know, someone a ranking officer, and we were in Iraq, and he told us to do something, like he said, hold this area, and then he left. We're going to do the last thing that he commanded us to do, right? We're not going to deviate from that plan. We're going to do the last thing that the commanding officer told us to do. So what we're doing is the last thing that King Jesus, who reigns in all righteousness for all of eternity, told us to do. He said in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, go, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's basically the last thing to do. He, he left, he came back, he died on the cross, he left, he came back. This was the last conversation that he had with the disciples, right? Beautiful, very simple. So, I want to show you guys something. When he told them that, to the left here is Acts 1 through 5, Acts 6 through 9, Acts 10 through 28. Do you see the red circle? When he told them that, this is a time frame of the next 60 years. 60 years, okay? It, the, the gospel is the uttermost parts of the world. It's the Roman Empire. They didn't have like a globe. They didn't have any of that. They had a flat map, right? The gospel had only reached a red circle. They're on the Great Commission. Their signs are flow, flowing in signs and miracles, the Holy Spirit, all this stuff. Acts 6 through 9, they get the blue circle. And then finally, they get, you know, all the way to Rome and all that. And then these are all the little places that Paul had basically reached out to with the gospel. And most of your letters are written there. So 60 years, 50, 60 years, some things when you study it out, 65 years or something. That was his whole life. It was a generational assignment. I think that's really cool because in our region, the things that we're doing, we're in a generational assignment too. The foundation, the, the, everything that we're building, the seasons of growth, this is lifelong. We've all been invited into an assignment that promotes purpose. God's redemptive plan for the earth. Right? Is that cool? Amen. So to finish on the Great Commission, Matthew 24, 14, this is a foundational scripture. A lot of people think uh, and I'm not going to get into theology. I'm going to leave that to Pastor Chris because he's really good and he's detailed with all the theology stuff. I love theology. It's important. But this, to me, has always been a core thing. And this, he, the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. And I believe like that's the end of, of this age, the end of everything. Like As we know it, that's when Jesus will return. So... Um, salvation, we went on there. I just want to, this is a very surfacey word, but the word salvation, um, it means, uh, number two there, deliverance from sin and its consequences believed by Christians to be brought about by faith in Christ, the Christian gospel of salvation for all mankind. To believe that counted to you for righteousness, very easy. Jesus is coming back. I didn't want to draw it out with a bunch of scriptures, but you see the smiley face in the heart? That's cute. Yeah. You guys like that? Yeah, we got my yeah. Yeah. We're smiling. We got hearts and stuff. Like the whole world, wicked and perverse generation, and we're looking at a smiley face. Bible study emotion. Because Jesus loves us, and he's coming back because he loves us. There's the day of the Lord. This is real. This is foundational. You know, he's coming back. But um, in Revelations, there's a word, Maranatha. A lot of uh, global evangelisms use this word. It means our Lord cometh or our Lord will come. So if you ever hear Maranatha, Front Frontier Alliance, um, they're in the Mediterranean Basin, Gulan Heights. They're really, really impacting. Uh, they, uh, they, they have a stronghold and they're really projecting into the 1040 window. Their big scheme, is, their big thing is Maranatha. Come, Lord, come. And they get it from the Greek word in Revelations. All believers are excited that Jesus is coming. We don't have to fear. It doesn't matter what your life looks like. He's coming. So we already went over this. I 
want you guys to remember this. Assignment promotes purpose. Look at some of these words for assignment in the Greek when they were talking about it. Look at uh, G632 apophenomo. It means to assign a portion, render as due. Derived from the Greek word 525, apo, to dispense proper portion. You know that fulfill, purpose brings fulfillment? A deeper fulfillment, Josh, like your deeper fulfillment is helping people, serving Jesus, right? That gives you more fulfillment than probably anything, right? you know? And we're, we have access to that stuff too. God gave us purpose as a way to have that inner fulfillment. Okay, I'm trying to get through it. The body, this is my next point, the body. And we're about halfway through. Creative assignments in the body. So instead of quoting 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4, I want to show you guys this real quick. Does anyone know what the adductor longus is in the body? This is how creative God is. Okay? It's the tendon and muscle in your inner thighs, like up here. Yeah. So when you walk, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to look stupid. Okay, you ready? See Bobby look stupid? Okay, here we go. It, when we walk, <laughs> our leg only comes in and realigns our leg to the inside because we have this muscle, the adductor longus, right? If we didn't have it, every time we walked, we would walk outward like this until we did the splits. Oh, our wow. whole body would walk like that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And I think that that's super cool because if you take this one small part of the body, or one person that God brings into the kingdom or into our family or community or whatever, we walk a little different. Mm. Everyone's important. Everyone has a purpose. A mission statement. We refuse. Sometimes we forget a mission statement. I'm not taking a shot at anyone, but we have to stay focused on our assignment because if we lose track. Now look what the mission statement means. A mission statement is the point of trajectory <coughs> from which all your program or your assignment or purpose, structures and strategies will evolve. It should prevent you from random and meaningless activities. That really spoke to me. Again, assignment promotes purpose. I want to I want to read five really quick ones. I'm not going to quote the scriptures, but Exodus. These are creative assignments in the body. Exodus 31, 1 through 11. It shows Bezalel. Who knows what Bezalel did? Oh, my Bible scholars don't know about Bez. Oh, Bezalel. Okay, look. Bezalel had a creative assignment. What's up, man? Th this guy had a grace on his life for artisan works. When they were building the temple, right? Carving silver. Carving silver, making stuff. He went to Home Depot. He ordered all his supplies, <laughs> right? He was laying slabs. Like, he had, like, the concrete going. I don't know. I don't want to, like, you know what I'm saying? But he was really gifted. And he had a partner named Eholab. Eh, eh, and basically, when Moses came and assigned tasks, he was up there like chiseling the temple and all that stuff. The same temple that didn't get destroyed until 70 AD when the Romans finally came and, and got him. It's the one that Jesus said, you see these stones? Not one will lay upon another. And you see? And he was actually like prophesying like, hey, the Romans are going to break in here and all this stuff and all your thing. Yeah. It's pretty good. So he really built something that lasted. Generational assignment. Uh, Luke 4, look at Jesus. He says, for this reason he was sent. Jesus, uh, you know, he said, uh, I must preach the kingdom of God in other cities also. He knew his purpose. He knew his assignment. He was always focused on what the Father had told him to do. I think that's so awesome. First Corinthians, or Chronicles 25, David actually sets musicians as their assignment. Isn't that cool? Like, you don't have to be everything to everybody. You just got to play your one position. You got to play your one part of the body. And God is so creative, and we all have a part to play for us to function correctly. Isn't that cool? Acts 9, Ananias. I think about Ananias. God spoke to him, and he prayed for Paul, and the scales came off of his eyes. Think about that. You're just going about your day-to-day -day life. And then all of a sudden, God says, hey, this dude's coming. And then Ananias responds, or you respond, I don't know. This dude's known for, like, killing people to believe in you, God. And he's like, don't worry about it. He's my chosen. He's my chosen, man. Just pray for him when he comes. And then all of a sudden, this dude who's a known murderer comes in. And then, like, he comes in and he says, like, you know, you'll receive your sight in the Holy Spirit now. In Jesus' name. Bam. 
That was his whole assignment. He was a prayer warrior. All he had to do was pray. He didn't have to. He didn't have to do anything but pray. It was super cool, right? And then uh, there's a couple <laughs> other ones, but I'm not going to draw it out. Uh, dude, think about Ezekiel as a watchman and all this stuff. When you read the Bible, those creative assignments and graces that God gives you, it's all to fulfill a purpose. So the purpose, unreach, unreach, culture, context, and entry-level community building, relationship building. So considering that I'm like an outreach guy, when we do community initiatives and we have a very fruitful outreach. This is something that's always been really important to me. Um, I, I've studied a lot of it. When I first got the Holy Spirit for a couple years, it's basically all I did was read books, read books, read books, and went to a couple schools. Basically, what you guys think of culture, culture and nations, it's ethnos. When Jesus said the gospel will be preached, to all nations, it was the word ethnos. Basically, the word that we use for that is ethnicities for all cultures everywhere. So this is why it's very important not to get too trapped in addiction culture or street culture or close your mind to what you what you know, because he's actually giving you a grace to be able to speak to people outside of the culture that you've known, right? And we practice that when we go out there. So this is the 1040 window. You guys know about the 1040 window? Anyone ever been taught about that before? Show of hands. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I taught it at Crossroads. This is the 1040 window, man. So it's basically this window on the earth. There's about 8 billion people on the world right now. It used to be 6, but now there's 8. And we'll look at the numbers really quick, but roughly it's about 4 billion people live in this window. 4 billion. It's about half the world's population. And basically, like 1% or 2% know about Jesus. It's, it's, it's crazy. So these are all the countries. It's the 1040 window. They don't got cell phones. They don't got nothing, man. It's like third world stuff, right? So it says 4.5 or 4.65 billion people is 90% of the world's poorest and 95% of the people that live in this window have never heard of Jesus. They don't have Facebook, like none of that. And if they do, it's like, they just, it, it's not like us. It's not like they just have access to stuff. Think about culture. Bless. Bless. This guy is really awesome. His name's Charles Kraft. And I want to read this really quick and we'll move forward. He says, what is God's view of culture? Is Jewish culture created by God and therefore to be imposed on everyone who follows God? Or is there some indication in scripture that God has taken different, a different position? And he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 22, where Paul articulates um, God, you know, God's approach to cultural diversity and Paul says while working with Jews I live like a Jew but when working with Gentiles I live like a Gentile his approach basically it says is to become all things to all men that I might save some of them by whatever means are possible so I thought this was important to put this in here Kraft also said this is a famous quote by Charles Kraft he says people are to culture as a fish is to water does a fish know that he's in water? You guys all go fishing and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Does a freshwater fish know that he's in fresh water? Does he even know that he's in water? Did we know that we're outside of water and breathing air until someone told us? No. So like when we're out there on outreach or you're praying for someone at the gas station, you know, or you're on a job site and you're in the uh, marketplace discipleship and stuff, what you guys are doing. You got to remember that we've taken on a new culture. We've taken on a complete new culture, a Jesus culture. Our worldview, our core values, everything that, that um, we believe, it's created a new culture inside of us. You, even the people that you used to know is not your culture anymore. It's not. We have a kingdom culture. And other people are, are in a complete different culture. That's why people don't understand us anymore. That's why there's a bridge between us and the world. 
And so what I've learned, what we've learned together as a community and family with our outreach is that a lot of the guys who are out there are in, even though we can relate to them because that's who we were, they don't see us for who we were. Right, Vernon? Like sometimes you even go up and you say, yeah, man, I, I've been through struggles just the same and they don't even believe you. They can't even imagine that you had ever been where they'd been in a place of darkness or, or whatever, right? So there's a cultural gap there. It's the same with world missions. It's the same in the context to our community and what we're, we're trying to do as we're reaching out to people. And the number one thing with any outreach or anything that we're doing in the community is just to establish relationship, right? So like if someone came in here and had a book and started quoting it and reading it to us and being kind of uh, forceful with us, we would immediately reject it, right? It's the same out there. It's the same out there. So the number one thing that we wanna do is emphasize building relationship on their turf. When Paul went to Rome or Ephesus or wherever he was there, whenever he resisted culture or whenever he challenged culture, the understanding that the people had, what happened? I mean, in Ephesus, he got beat down, right? Uh, the Romans imprisoned him. Come on, it's all these struggles, it's all culture. And culture is influenced by the Ephesians 6, spirits and principalities. We once were a part of that, but we're not anymore. Now we walk according to, to the Holy Spirit. So we have a different culture. No, it's kind of a deep thought, it's a train of thought. This is the core beliefs when we go out there and we do outreach. Not just to have a good time, the, the good time just happens. We have a great time. But the important thing is, is that we're going into a foreign land Right? We're not of the world. We're in the world, but not of the world. We're going into a foreign land with a world, with a word inside of us and a belief that ends in eternal salvation, eternal life. You see? People aren't going to believe that. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to believe it at first. So we have to gain their trust, build relationship, and when appropriate, invite deeper. Invite them deeper. Deeper relationship. Look, Vernon, if I just barely met you, and you invited me to come to your house for dinner, I probably wouldn't. Five minutes later, I'm gonna be like, I don't know, his hands look dirty, he likes pork, I like steak, right? <laughs> same thing. They're just not eating the same thing. These are just different structures and ideas on how to be fruitful and multiply. Uh, and then here's something that I really, really got, got to before, is serving ministries I always thought that they, and I'm just going to be transparent, I always thought that they were a waste of time. Like, I, I, I we read the, the, the toxic charity, and I was like, you know what? I, this just isn't, I just want to go preach the word. I want to get a microphone and just go preach the word, and the word will compel them. But the truth is, is that serving ministries establish relationships, um, and, they, and they, they, they're like a engager that allows us to build community and allows us to get to know people over time. Uh, I'll uh, quote one thing off of here and we'll be done with this This portion is Dick Brogdon from Live Dead. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him, but Live Dead is a, is a, it's a very fruitful um, global ministry and they intentionally get people from the United States and they go into the 1040 window, right? And instead of going and imposing um, Western culture on the people in the East and the unreached. He, he has a famous saying that says, they belong before they believe. So you don't have to have some big confession of faith to Jesus before I'm your friend. I love you and know that you belong in the kingdom before you do. And it takes, what it does is, is, is it takes that pressure away that I need to immediately get a confession of faith from someone the first time that I meet him. You see, I want you guys to walk with freedom. You just get to love people. They belong before they believe, man. They belong before they believe. Culture, uh, why it's important to, to consider culture when doing outreach. So there has to be a sensitivity when, when we go on outreach to other people's culture. Not only their culture, and I'm not talking white, black, Hispanic, Asian, Japanese. I'm talking culture in the sense of 
their understanding and the way that they view the world, right? So our understanding and the way we view the world before, um, or even now, we're probably not going to make friends until I understand that you understand me. So we're not to lord over people and come over top of them. Jesus gave us a good example that we come under and we serve them and wash feet and serve and show love. And then they see there's a genuine differentness in our hearts. And then that's what opens their heart to us. And then the love of God comes in. So, you know, I'm all about preaching. I'm all about this stuff. This was just some core beliefs and understanding my perspective of how the Lord has raised me in outreach. And I think that it's pretty fruitful. I think this is something I use even when I met Scott Melton the first time. Everyone I met, every single person in this room. As I got to know you before I projected myself onto you. And you guys are all my dear brothers and friends. Even Trent. I think I think we use this theme to, to get Trent from an outreach, actually. We, I think that I use this... This, this wisdom from God, not scheme wisdom from God on just about every person in this room or every every rescue, every person that we meet on outreach, every single person is to come under and serve them. And when they see the genuineness of our heart, they open it up and then I go ahead and just start filling every seat that I can. I want to be a wise, a wise um, planner. Get it in there. Make sure that it's soft ground. Sometimes it takes a lot of hard work to till that ground up. I mean, look at Pat. <laughs> These are some really cool, cool examples. Any hired baker or any of the world evangelists or, or whatever would be proud of this. This is a key example when I look at this SC culture. You got three got three construction workers and then a dude living in an abandoned building. These dudes are getting paychecks, eating three meals a day, or at least it looks like Rusty's <laughs> Rusty missed a meal like me. <laughs> I missed the in like four years. So, <laughs> but I mean, it's the same thing. This this is a culture thing. So, um, awesome. Our uh, brewer has been working with this guy for like a year. He's got to know him. A year. He always shows up to the same place to offer him something to eat. This guy sometimes he yells at us. He runs us off. <laughs> a year. He's getting to know his culture. It would be no different if we went to the 1040 window. We're urban missionaries, urban missionaries when we go out there. We have an assignment that promotes God's purpose. Look at old Tyler out here, right? Look at that picture. Just the picture's worth a thousand words, right? He's just, Tyler just loving on him, showing love. You know this guy, he lives in the neighborhood. You know he's consistent now. And every time he comes, he doesn't have to get, like, a 10-point sermon. He just gets loved on, man. Get some food. I seen that dude out there broke and disgusted. The next time I seen him, he was throwing the football with the neighborhood kids in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> That's so good, you know? And look, this is just one Monday. This is a, a random Monday out there. We're consistently getting like on a on a slow night maybe 30 40 people but on a medium night 50 to 100 it's not an exaggeration you can't go into the multitudes right here waving a bible at them you got to go in here with a heart full of love so if i left you guys with anything as for this presentation is that when i say it's going to take 5 to 10 minutes it's going to take 25 there's a timer on my slide. Okay? So the next thing that I want to talk about, let's just go to 2 Samuel 16. Make it legal with some Bible verses because Pastor Chris, he, he's, <laughs> he's all about credit. Or did you open the word? <laughs> and I love him for it. I love him for it. So I'll set a context really quick. And we're going to run through 2 Samuel 16. I wrote a couple points here. I think it's going to be really good. So 2 Samuel 16, I want to start with a proverb 8. It said in the Passion, it says, Can you hear the voice of wisdom from the top of the mountain of influence? She speaks into the gateways of the glorious city, in the place where pathways merge at the entrance of every portal 
There she stands ready to impart understanding, shouting aloud to all who enter, preach her sermon, to those who will listen. And she, look what, look what she says, wisdom. I'm calling to you, sons of Adam, yes, and to you, daughters, as well. Listen to me, and you will be prudent and wise. For even the foolish and feeble can receive an understanding heart that will change their inner being. The meaning of all my words will release within you revelation for you to reign in life. God, that's so good. And now let's look at, let's look at 2 Samuel 16, 5 through 14. And let's see how even in this time of adversity that David was was going through, and I'm going to lay it on thick, we're really going to see that he was going through a lot more than most of us are going through right now. Maybe some of us are going through it, but we're still going to see wisdom and maturity and the transformed heart revealed under pressure. 2 Samuel 16, 5 through 14. Now, when King David came to Baharim, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Jerah. Coming from there, he came out cursing continuously as he came. Now, Behirim, if you look up this word in the Hebrew, it means a choice, warlike, or valiant. So he was at a place called Behirim. It seemed like he was just walking, but in the spiritual realm, he understood the time and season he was in in his life. And that he was in a time of war He was in a time to show that he was valiant In these situations And we need to know what our weapons of warfare are And we need to know what time and season that we're in Because it looked like he was just walking He was in a painful situation He was going through a struggle He was going through a testing But in the spiritual realm Baharim He was in a time of war <laughs> 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but they're for divine power to destroy strongholds. And, in, and I just quoted the psalm, and he said, in the pathways. I believe that's always saying that wisdom is, is, is speaking to us in the pathways. In every decision, you can go this way, you can go that way. And our flesh would want us to respond one way, and the spirit would want you to respond another way. And in these situations of difficulty, as we abide in the word of God and we allow the spirit of wisdom to instruct us, he gives us the correct response in each situation. We all get, we all miss it. We all have the temptation to run. We all have the temptation to quit. We all have the temptation to handle things one way. But wisdom is always there telling us to, to handle it another way. A couple weapons of our warfare are praise and prayer. The intimate exchange in prayer when we, you know, resting, trusting God rather than worrying. And now I'm recognizing community and falling on the strengths of the body when we're aware of our weaknesses. As we acknowledge our weaknesses, guys, we exploit or we magnify or we value the strengths of the ones around us. We can't do it alone. We need each other. Verse 6. And he threw stones at David and all the servants of King David. And he said, and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and his left hand. I'm going to make a note on that. But verse 7, also Shimon said thus when he cursed, come out, come out, you bloodthirsty rogue. You bloodthirsty rogue. Rogue. Oh, no. I'm about to go, boy. You bloodthirsty rogue So he's got all his homies with him Or six and seven he's Got all his friends And I'm going to go quickly now But it would be like It would be like Vernon or Stanford And he's got all of us with him And we're walking and we're on a journey And then all of a sudden some dude just comes up And is like Stanford you bloodthirsty rogue <laughs> And he's throwing rocks at him And all this different kind of stuff and I know Stanford, so at the crossroads of his decisions, at the paths, <laughs> where the portals pour out, and the, you know, right? He may be tempted to throw a rock back. 
He may just come out of them all, you know. He may go South Columbus on them. I'm just saying. <laughs> South Angel Mouth Okay. And then, okay, but that's that that's some uh, that's a point I wanted to say when we're with our friends and stuff, because he's about to talk about the sons of Zariah. So we'll get there when we get there. And then these dudes calling him out of his name, speaking a false identity over him. Verse 8. He's in a time of war. This dude's already planting seed. Verse 8. The Lord has brought up upon all the blood of the house of Saul. He's bringing up his past. He's bringing up his enemies. He's, what? In whose place you have reigned. He's saying, man, you're not even rightfully supposed to reign. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. So now you are caught in their own evil. Because you are a bloodthirsty man, you rogue. In verse 9, he says, Then Abishah, the son of Zariah, said to the king, his homies were with him. So there you go. There's Tyler again, playing Absalom over there to Stanford as the dude's flexing on him at the gas station or on the job site. Uh -huh. And he says, Why should this dead dog curse my friend Stanford? Or the Lord King David. Please let me go over there and I'm going to cut off his head. I think about this in these situations and I, I read the Psalms and I see that, that David is showing his heart to the Lord in these situations. You flash over to Psalm 6, 8 through 10, it says, The Lord judges the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. That psalm takes a, a new a new dynamic when you're thinking about him getting called a rogue and, and all his past getting brought up and stones getting thrown at him. Right? Verse 10, it says, But the king said to Tyler, I mean the sons of Zariah, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? Let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, Curse David. Who then shall say you have done so? Right? So he's basically saying, like, let it ride. The sons of Zariah had a worldly mindset. Psalm 17, arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him. Deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword. From the men of your hand, O Lord, from the men of this world whose portion is in this life. He's saying the sons of Zariah had a whole different cultural belief. They're riding with them, but they're not developed yet. Their heart has not reached a point of maturity in the Christian faith or in love. That in a time of difficulty, they would respond according to David's transformed heart. See, the Psalms, he was writing from the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks or sings or journals. And in difficulty, when you squeeze an orange, whatever's inside is going to come out. And right there, I believe in this situation, that's what, what, that's what David was still carrying in his heart. Verse 11, and David said to Abishah and all his servants, see how my own son who came from my own body seeks my life? How much more now may this Benjamite let him alone and let him curse, for so the Lord has ordered him. Romans 5, 3 through 5. I'm just going to quote a quick one. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put to shame because God, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And adversity, if, you, if you're barely hanging on, and I've been there, guys. Believe me, I've been there. I get there in a cycle often. At least once a year, it feels like. I get to a point where I'm not walking in the fullness of hope. My abiding's gotten off. I'm not being filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm not uh, stepping into each new faith or hope by faith. I'm barely rooted in enough love to where I have enough spiritual fuel and, and energy to complete my next task. But bubbling over with hope and faith... It's, it's a challenge for us sometimes. We need, to, we need to continually abide to receive the new hope and step into that hope by faith. We need to have community and authority to speak into our life. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that. It makes it a lot easier sometimes. You know? Number two, when we speak, we don't know how deep the words actually go. Like a stone dropping into a lake. When he's talking about these things, this isn't an isolated incident. The enemy is bringing up 2 Samuel 13, Amnon, Tamar, and Absalom. Amnon, Tamar, and Absalom. 
he's basically talking about some very dramatic and disgusting stuff that happened in David's home. Really, really yucky stuff. He's bringing up bad stuff. So as he's walking, he's remembering all these things. The words are triggering thoughts in, in David. So he's remembering his mistakes. He's remembering all these things that he could have done different. I got a fire teaching on 2 Samuel 13. I'm going to share with you guys. Like, if we can do it. I'll, I'll share the notes with you. It goes into the really the deep-rooted stuff that happened and the decisions that David made that are actually manifesting in Amnon and Absalom. <laughs> He's doing some of the same things that David did with Bathsheba, the manipulation, the murder, the different things. This is crazy. So I think as he's walking and this dude's bringing up this stuff, he's thinking about those things. And he's still showing maturity. In verse 11, and David said to Absalom and all the servants, see how my son from my, came from my own body seeks my life. So he's telling me, I got two people trying to murder me. You're worried about a dude throwing some rocks? How much more now? May this Benjamite let him alone and let him curse, for so the Lord has ordered him. Sufferings, 1 Peter 4, 1, real quick. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, renewed mind. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I believe in context to this that, yeah, Stanford wanted to go up there and let, let Tyler cut that dude's head off. But Stanford was in a moment where he was suffering in the sense that he was denying his flesh that he was uncomfortable and he responded according to the Holy Spirit. If you die to yourself, you live to Christ, you live to the Holy Spirit. There's a suffering right there. And the scripture is saying, if you've suffered in the flesh, you've ceased from sin. David's reached a point of maturity right there. Yeah, he wanted to, yeah, he wanted to cut his head off. Yeah, he wanted to go gossip. Yes, he wanted to, to challenge the dude's character. Yes, he wanted to use his influence to crush the guy. But he suffered, gave it to God. And ceased from sin. Verse 12. It may be that the Lord will take look at all my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for cursing this day. The situation we go through and the sufferings that we go through always ends with blessing, guys. Lord. He's developing something inside of us. His glory is going to be revealed when you pass the test. And the test is simply to allow God to transform your heart from the inside out. Walk through a situation according to the spirit and not the flesh. And then he says, I can promote this guy. I can give him more influence. I can give him more responsibility. Because when the pressure comes, he's going to respond with suffering and the leading of wisdom who cries out at the portals. And as David and his men went along the road, Shemai went along the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went, threw stones at him and kicked up dust. Patience and endurance, fellas. Hebrews 6, 12, and we're almost done. That you become not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience shall inherit the promises. You got promises, you got hope. We only receive it through patience and endurance. There's no sidestepping. You can't step out of process. Now... The king and all the people who were with him became weary, so they refreshed themselves there. And this will be my last scripture. I hope we got something out of this. Immediately when I'm done, I'll go into prayer and we can start our week, and it's going to be a great week. But this is going to be 1 Peter 4, 7. Since we are approaching the end of all things, be intentional, purposeful, and self-controlled so that you can be given to prayer. And now there's nothing more important than prayer. The intimate exchange with the Holy Spirit. This morning I seen, I went, I, I seen Pat, I said, hey, I'm taking Drew, I got to get over here so I can get some prayer before we speak. I need the presence there, I need him to saturate this place, we need the Holy Spirit. But he was already in his room with some instrumental going, pressing into the Lord. The intimate exchange of prayer is much more rich when we're not going to him repenting for walking according to culture, the sons of Zariah or whatever. And when we approach him, when we're receiving his love and affirmation in his instruction. That's prayer, guys. So right now, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I bless these men. I thank you for what you're doing with Able Electric. I thank you. Uh, I thank you for Josh. I thank you for Pam. I thank you. I thank you for Chris and, and everyone. I thank you for all these men in this community you're building here. I thank you for the patience and endurance. 
Thank you for maturity and wisdom crying out. And I bless my brothers. I thank you for them so much. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 See you guys later. What's up, brother? What's up? Well, good.